good evening everyone uh, welcome to the virtual competitive algebra seminar we uh, welcome today prashant sridhar from tata institute and he will speak on finding maximal cohn macaulay modules prashant you may please start your seminar um, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, i would like to thank the organizers for uh, this opportunity to speak and <clears throat> um, if you'll excuse me there seems to be an issue with the power uh, just one moment please Uh, Prashant, can you start the microphone? It appears like there is a glitch with the power uh, here. And, okay, it's just... Please. Yeah, uh, it, it just appears like my uh, charger is suddenly okay. Yeah, I'm, I apologize for this. Um, <clears throat> apologize for the delay. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, uh, thank the organizers in general for organizing this wonderful seminar. Uh, it's been a pleasure attending all the talks. <clears throat> so during the talk, I'll just keep my video off and turn it back on. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> as the title suggests, um, I'm going to talk about a few fundamental questions concerning maximal cohen macaulay modules. And uh, so <clears throat> there's ultimately I want to get to a problem that lies uh, in uh, the confluence of two topics. One is MCMs and the other, which is in other words, maximal cohen macaulay modules. And the other is mixed characteristic commutative algebra. So roughly the outline of the talk would be uh, to look at some motivation and some past results, and then ultimately consider an approach to a problem and look at the first results that uh, we obtain. <clears throat> okay. So uh, throughout this talk, I'll maintain the following convention. So unless specified otherwise, I'm just going to assume all rings are unital, commutative, and Noetherian. And all modules are finitely generated unless specified otherwise. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'll start with the notion of uh, Cohen Macauliness. So it is um, basically it needs the geometric notion of dimension to some sense agree with the homological notion of depth. So when <clears throat> this property holds, nice things happen in the ring and it's uh, pretty convenient to work over. So <clears throat> One may think of this geometrically as varieties such that the finite intersection of general hypersurfaces is unmixed, or in other words, has no uh, embedded components. <clears throat> so more formally, a local ring R is cohen macaulay if the depth equals its dimension. So depth is basically uh, the maximal length of a regular sequence on the ring, and dimension, I mean cruel dimension. <clears throat> So um, cohen macaulay rings enjoy some really nice properties from the homological side. So for instance, all intermediate local cohomology modules vanish. And there exists a good duality theory for uh, these rings. So in general, it makes it uh, pretty convenient to work over. And it's a good generalization of regular local rings. <clears throat> but uh, if how about non cohen macaulay rings? Is it all bad news. Um, I would say that if it can admit a maximal Cohen Macaulay module, or what some people call a small Cohen Macaulay module, then <clears throat> it it provides many of the benefits of the Cohen Macaulay property in the ring itself. So, <clears throat> yes. So, what is a maximal Cohen Macaulay module then? Um, so, if you have a dimension d ring, local ring, 
non-zero module M is a, a maximal Cohen Macaulay module if it is finitely generated and satisfies any of the following equivalent conditions. So, uh, uh, firstly, every uh, system of parameters of R is a regular sequence on M. So that is actually equivalent to some system of parameters of R being a regular sequence on M. And uh, it needs the depth equal to the dimension, but is also equal to the dimension of the ring, the maximum possible dimension. And it requires, uh, essentially in saying it in other words, all the local cohomology modules except the top one uh, vanishes. So they're equivalent notions. Uh, so there is the notion of a big Cohen-Macaulay module, which is uh, <clears throat> almost the same thing that it's not finitely generated. Oops. So, um, <clears throat> but in that case, one should note that the notion of some system of parameters of R being a regular sequence on M is not necessarily equivalent to every system of parameters uh, being <clears throat> uh, a regular sequence on the module. But however, if we complete the ring and the module, then uh, they're actually the same thing. <clears throat> okay. So if one can wonder, how do non cohen macaulay rings admit MCMs? Here is a, a basic example. So uh, <clears throat> this, this ring is uh, not unmixed, so it's not, it's not cohen macaulay But um, this R modulo X is an R module, and that is a cohen macaulay uh, module or R. So in some sense, it has better properties than the ring itself. <clears throat> Excuse me again, there seems to be an issue with the power again. So I just need um, a few seconds to fix this. Um. Thanks for bearing with me. <clears throat> okay. So why would one wonder about the existence of an MCM? Uh, so in many situations, it's useful. So to name a few, uh, it gives us info about the structure of the ring. Uh, for instance, uh, it, computing the multiplicity of an MCM is relatively easy. So that can be in fact used to compute the multiplicity of the ring. <clears throat> and uh, it also tells us things about the properties of algebras over the ring. So <clears throat> they come in quite handy. But at this point, the most compelling reason for it would be that the existence of MCMs for complete local domains implies an important statement, which is positivity of um, Sayre's intersection multiplicity conjecture. <clears throat> so before I actually look at that statement, let me note the following, <clears throat> that MCMs or CM rings or in other words, cohen macaulay rings have been studied quite extensively. So there's a rich theory uh, in this case, and there are many beautiful connections to the singularities of the ring. Okay. For instance, finding MCMs um, is relatively easier in this case, because high CCGs of any given module are going to be MCM when this ring has the cohen macaulay property. <clears throat> and some basic examples, would be like if we just start with regular rings, then MCM is just the same as free. And over hypersurfaces, MCMs can uh, be characterized by matrix factorizations of elements. And uh, if you go to complete intersections, uh, lots of studies have taken place in that setting as well. <clears throat> uh, but not as much is known in the non cohen macaulay case. And many fundamental questions actually remain unanswered. <clears throat> So here's a conjecture of Hoxter uh, from the 1970s. So he conjectured that every complete local domain admits a maximal cohen macaulay module, also called a small cohen macaulay module because of the emphasis on finite generation. So over local rings that are not catenary, there are examples of non-existence of MCMs. So, um, they can be considered pathological. And in fact, the domain that admits a MCM hacks to be universally catenary. So the complete hypothesis is pretty well justified. Moreover, uh, the question of uh, Sayre's intersection multiplicity positivity reduces to the complete case. So uh, <clears throat> it's 
not assuming much. Okay. So Hoxner also introduced a, the variant of big Cohen Macaulay modules. And uh, the purpose of that primarily was that it implies all the other homological conjectures. <clears throat> and But it does not imply Serre's positivity. So the existence of big Cohen Macaulay algebras um, is now known. And uh, in characteristic P, it's due to Hoxner and Hineke, and the difficult mixed characteristic case due to um, Andre in uh, uh, 2016. Okay. The advantage of the small Cohen Macaulay module conjecture, however, as we uh, saw earlier, is that it implies positivity of Serre intersection multiplicity conjecture. <clears throat> so, what is this conjecture, and why? Um, how did it uh, originate? So, <clears throat> it uh, concerns studying isolated points of intersection of two varieties. And so this actual statement itself is a more formal version of this uh, situation. So suppose S is our regular local ring of dimension D and MN and finite modules such that the tensor product has uh, finite length. Then uh, Sayer defined this to be the intersection multiplicity here. So <clears throat> this is the basically like an uh, um, Euler characteristic, and uh, it sums over the lengths of the torsion modules. Okay, so he asserted the following three things: that uh, the dimension, the sum of the dimensions, is always going to be less than d. Um, Serre himself proved this um, for all regular local rings, and then there was this statement: where if the dimension is strictly less than d then the Euler characteristic has to be zero. This was um, um, proved by um, Gillette and Sule and Roberts independently. And um, this final statement here, in general, is not known. Sayre already proved this in the case when the regular local ring is unramified. So it's only open in the case when S is a mixed characteristic ramified regular local ring. And uh, the major progress was made by Gaber, who showed that this is greater than or equal to zero. But we don't know strict positivity yet in the ramified case. <clears throat> okay. So recently, uh, Bart, Hoxter, and Ma introduced what are called Lim Cohen Macaulay sequences for a complete local domain. And the purpose of this is that this implies Serre positivity. And it's in some sense a weaker notion to a, a maximal Cohen Macaulay module. <clears throat> okay, so coming back to uh, the, our question of uh, existence of MCMs, um, the problem is that the existence of MCMs for complete local domains in any characteristic is only known in very few cases. So although this has powerful implications, it's, it's pretty difficult to find these things. So <clears throat> when the ring is itself uh, not Cohen Macaulay. And in dimension one, it's trivial because any domain is going, any domain is going to be one dimensional domain is Cohen Macaulay. And in dimension two, one can take the integral closure and uh, that is going to be a finite Cohen Macaulay module. But in dimension three and higher, it's uh, known only in very few cases. Okay. On the other hand, um, in other directions related to the same problem, there have been examples of non-existence of rank one MCMs, um, like Burton in 1965, Keel 1974, Mori in 1977, Marcelo and Schenzel in more recently in 2011, and most recently by uh, Lynch in 2018. So many of these construct um, non-Cohen Macaulay UFDs, and so they provide uh, the class group is trivial, so uh, there can be rank one MCMs, <clears throat> and. Uh, Haynes um, in 99 uh, also showed that existence of MCM modules preserved or Seger products in characteristic P, uh, essentially. So uh, <clears throat> that's some kind of a reduction. And Tavanfar uh, showed that the small Cohen Macaulay module conjecture reduces to the case of UFDs. And so <clears throat> these are some results that um, uh, make some attempts to reduce the conjecture. OK, so let me now uh, talk a little bit about one of the major existence results that exist at this point of time. And that is independently due to Hartshorn, Hoxter, uh, and Peskin and Shapiro. 
So uh, what they show is the following. We start with the perfect field of positive characteristic and R is in N graded domain that is finitely generated over this field. And then if R is cohen macaulay on the punctured spectrum, then R admits a graded MCM module. So in characteristic P, uh, in all the nice cases, if it's CM on the punctured spectrum, then we can find uh, a graded MCM. <clears throat> so corollary to this would be, as you can guess, would be in dimension three. Um, so in dimension three, uh, if it's, we have an N graded domain finitely generated over a field, it need not be perfect. Then um, if the characteristic is positive, then R admits a small cohen macaulay module. So uh, this follows pretty readily because uh, we can take the integral closure, the grading is preserved, and it's finite. And <clears throat> so that's going to be the uh, integral closure satisfies S2. So <clears throat> this follows. And more recently, um, Schoutens showed that a three-dimensional, what he calls pseudo-graded ring of positive characteristic admits a um, MCM module. So this is in a generalization of uh, theorem one. OK. So uh, uh, since the title is Finding Maximal Cohen macaulay Modules, I want to just point out where they found this Maximal Cohen macaulay Module in this case. OK, <clears throat> okay so it's a nice argument. So D is the dimension of a ring, and M is the homogeneous maximal ideal. So uh, suppose the key observation here is that if M is a finite R module of maximal dimension, that is cohen macaulay on the punctured spectrum, then it actually implies that all the local cohomology modules, except the top one, have finite length. So this essentially follows from the fact that R is a quotient of a regular local ring. <clears throat> OK. So in particular, in our case, since R is CM on the punctured spectrum, we have that these lengths are finite for R m equals R basically, and for all i less than d. So let's just call z to be the sum of these lengths. So z is a finite uh, number. So for an integer e um, greater than or equal to 1, and for s between 0 to p to the e, let's say ms is this module. So this module is just all the graded pieces of R such that the um, uh, the index is congruent S modulo P to the E. So in other words, uh, the F star ER, which F here is the Frobenius map. So F star ER refers to R viewed as an R module under the E iterate of the Frobenius map. So it's just a direct sum of these MS. Okay. <clears throat> so we can choose E large enough so that the number of MS non-zero is greater than C. We can choose it. We can always do this. So the way this is defined, if we choose E large enough, we can choose it to be greater than anything we want. So in particular, greater than Z. Okay. So um, here this follows naturally now. So um, if you look at the local cohomology modules via the, the action of the iterate of the Frobenius map, uh, this equality readily follows. It's that these two commute. And um, this equality here is just from what we just observed. So we just saw that f star er is this direct sum. So <clears throat> we have that equality of these two. Now, the first thing is a z-dimensional k vector space, because we're just counting length. And we know that the length sum of those lengths is z. So the vector space dimension has to match over k of these two objects. But our choice of e then ensures that one of these um, uh, one of these graded pieces here have to be zero. I mean, across all d, across all i. So basically, H M I M R needs to be zero for some r between zero to p to the e and all i less than d. So that's exactly um, what we want. And moreover, r is f finite, so these m r's are finitely generated. So MR, this MR is a graded MCM module for R. So where it lies is that it is a um, summand of R viewed as an R module under the e -th iterator of the Frobenius map for large E. Okay. As we can see, this argument is not going to easily generalize to 
higher dimension, fortunately. So <clears throat> we'll turn elsewhere. And um, here, in general, if R is a complete local domain and S is a regular local subring, uh, like a Neuter normalization, then an R module M is MCM, if and only if it's a free S module. So one can try to start looking at it from this angle. And Hoxter observed that um, R admitting an MCM is essentially equivalent to the existence of a map, a ring homomorphism, from uh, R to the ring of matrices or S for N large enough, so that this ring sits inside that matrix ring, uh, such that its restriction to the regular ring S is just a scalar diagonal matrix embedding. <clears throat> so it's just another viewpoint to the same problem. Okay. So along these lines, uh, one can note that the small CM conjecture reduces to the integral closure of a complete regular local ring in a finite normal extension of its quotient field. So one may look at it systematically if, if you want by indexing it by Galois groups. So then it's natural to first look at nice Galois groups. Okay, so along these lines, um, Roberts showed in 1980 <clears throat> the following statement. It's a very clean statement. It says the following. Um, so we start with the, the integral closure of a regular local ring in a finite abelian extension of its quotient field is going to be CN provided, this is the key part, provided the degree of the extension is not divisible by the characteristic of the residue field. So um, the integral closures in finite abelian extensions of its quotient field is cohen macaulay provided we have this hypothesis. So the first thing we can see is that this applies to the equal characteristic zero case. That is when um, uh, the regular local ring contains Q. Unfortunately, the proof cannot be modified to accommodate the so-called modular case. That is when the characteristic of the residue field divides the order of the Galois group. So <clears throat> it doesn't exactly then mean that it fails then, but at least the proof won't work. So let me point out this uh, nice proof because I want to point out where exactly it fails in the modular case. So. <clears throat> Suppose S is a regular local ring, fraction field L, K is that finite abelian extension, the Galois group is G, R is the integral closure of S in that field K. So we first know that R, the integral closure, has an SG module structure, just because the Galois group preserves integral elements. And then this is our natural um, isomorphism as L vector spaces, but actually that is um, an isomorphism as LG modules. And um, further, the second isomorphism here is due to the normal basis theorem. So overall, this is an isomorphism actually as LG modules. <clears throat> okay. And further, he reduces to the case when S is complete with algebraically reduced, uh, sorry, algebraically closed uh, residue field. So um, we can start over and just assume those two things. <clears throat> So uh, Kg is going to be commutative. K is the residue field here, not the quotient field. And um, G is um, abelian, so Kg is commutative. And K is algebraically closed. So by um, Maschke's theorem, essentially, Kg decomposes as product of rings. And that is the critical part here. And because of Maschke's theorem. So uh, we get this nice decomposition for Kg. And after this, it's um, uh, S is complete, so we can lift idempotence. So this factorization essentially of SG lifts to SG because K is the residue field of S. Uh, SG has this nice factorization, each component isomorphic to S. And since R is an SG module, so R is also have, going to enjoy such a factorization R1 cross uh, Rn, and each Ri is a S, SI module. So we have these nice factorizations for S, G, and R. So on one hand, we have L, G, which is um, this natural uh, isomorphism. But then we know that S, G enjoys that factorization in point four. 
So if you just use that, we see that LG factors as a product of Ls. And on the other hand, um, LG is isomorphic to K by the normal basis theorem and K further by uh, what we observed earlier, essentially. And um, R is uh, right here. So again, if we apply this, we get that LG decomposes in two different ways like this. But the decompositions are actually canonical. So the isomorphism holds in every component, in each component. So it's true that component-wise, they're isomorphic for all i. So what this means is that ri is a rank 1 S module in particular. So if we, the final part of the proof is that R is a reflexive S module because it's uh, S2 when it's reflexive in co-dimension 1. And so each Ri is a reflexive S module. And it's in particular, it's a rank 1, as we saw earlier, rank 1 reflexive S module, and S is a UFD. So Ri is uh, actually a free module. So <clears throat> each Ri is uh, isomorphic to S, so R is a free S module. So that gives us the conclusion. <clears throat> OK. So as we see, the crucial aspect was that KG decomposes like that. And so in the cyclic modular case, for example, if you just take characteristic K equals P and order of G to be P as well, then KG looks something like this. So this certainly does not uh, enjoy that uh, decomposition. So, um, <clears throat> so this draws parallels with modular representation theory. So we are in a different world. OK. So one thing to note here, we still don't know if this theorem fails. Uh, this only says the proof does not go through. So um, Robert's theorem actually goes through if S is a UFD, in the sense that R is going to be a free S module. And um, Hoxter and Roberts gave an example of a local UFTS of mixed characteristic 2 such that its integral closure in a quadratic extension, so it's mixed characteristic 2 and quadratic extension of its quotient field, and they show that, that the integral closure does not admit any S-free module. So not just that it's not free, but does not admit any S-free module. So this at least shows that the proof will not go through. But again, the statement was for regular rings, so doesn't disprove that statement. Um, uh, the, uh, we actually note that the ring above is actually Cohen Macaulay. So the R they constructed is actually a Cohen Macaulay ring. And, <clears throat> and uh, Roberts also showed that the theorem fails if the hypothesis on G is relaxed. So if you have um, solvable or just nilpotent, this doesn't work. So um, uh, this abelian case is special. Okay. Okay. So the thing is, uh, Robert's theorem curiously actually fails in the modular case. Uh, it's not like we just need to find a different proof. It's it's actually a it's a phenomenon. So it actually fails in the mixed uh, in the modular case. So the first example of this was given by Co in eighty six. And it was the first and only example till our work of this phenomenon. His example was an abelian extension of degree 3, and uh, S is a ramified regular local ring of mixed characteristic 3, such that the integral closure is not Cohen Macaulay. OK. So um, <clears throat> Dan Cads in 99 uh, gave an example of a pth root extension of the quotient field of an unramified regular local ring, so, um, such that the integral closure is not cohen macaulay So this is essentially an unramified variant of Coase example. So um, I'll give a brief uh, overview of Katz's example to see why it fails. And uh, so <clears throat> let's just say S is our unramified regular local ring. I'll just abbreviate URLR for unramified regular local ring. Uh, of mixed characteristic 3. And suppose 3xy is part of a regular system of parameters for S. Then suppose if we set A to be so, and B to be so, and set F to be AB squared. So this is um, a non-square free element of the ring S. And so omega cubed is, uh, omega is a cube root of F. 
Okay. So uh, set Q to be this ideal and P to be this ideal of this hypersurface S join omega. So what are these ideals? Uh, P is actually the unique height one prime that contains three. And uh, then by a dimension one argument, it can be shown that R is uh, the inverse of Q intersect P. So that is, it's not, let's just assume that. So <clears throat> R is Q intersect P inverse. Okay. So then it's uh, it's it's seen easily that R is Cohen Macaulay if and only if J this ideal whose inverse is R lifts to a grade two perfect ideal in this localization of this polynomial ring um, here. So essentially, it needs to lift to a grade two perfect ideal there for R to be Cohen Macaulay. So we have this natural short exact sequence because uh, J is the intersection of Q and P tilde is just a lift to B. So then by simply uh, writing down what B mod Q tilde plus P tilde is, we get it's equal to this. And it's seen relatively easily that the depth of this is um, uh, depth of S minus three. And so by uh, uh, the depth lemma or, uh, or whatever. So these two are both Cohen Macaulay because Q and P both lift to regular sequences. So um, this is depth S minus two. That's a problem because it should be depth S minus one. And so uh, R is not um, Cohen Macaulay. <clears throat> however, if um, he notes that, however, if capital K is this um, adjustment to uh, Q inverse, then, uh, sorry, to adjustment to this um, ideal here, then M uh, setting it to be K intersect P inverse is actually a maximal Cohen Macaulay module for R. So this is an MCM module for a non Cohen Macaulay ring. So uh, he actually showed much more than that. He showed the following. He showed that the integral closure of an unramified regular local ring of mixed characteristic P in a pth root extension of its quotient field admits a birational MCM module. So um, <clears throat> this is an arbitrary element of the ring. And more recently, he showed that under certain circumstances, the existence of a birational MCM in extensions by a P to the nth root of a single element is shown. Okay. <clears throat> so with these in mind, we get to the question that uh, essentially we wanted to look at. So our motivating questions are, what are the obstructions one faces? in the modular case of Roberts' theorem. And as we saw by uh, in the previous slides, does the integral closure of an unramified regular local ring of mixed characteristic P in a finite generically abelian extension admit a maximal cohen macaulay module or algebra? And ideally birational, but <clears throat> that's still uh, negotiable. OK. <clears throat> All right. So how do we approach this, uh, this qu these questions? So we saw that the radical extensions are primary examples of the failure of Roberts' theorem. By this, I mean the examples that Co and Katz gave were both actually obtained by adjoining a pth root of a non-square free element. They were actually radical extensions. And um, so motivated by this, uh, we just use motivated by uh, Kummer theory. So given abelian extension with the Calva group, if the base field contains an nth root of unity, where n is the index of the group, then k is actually a repeated radical, uniform radical extension. So under the presence of suitable roots of unity, uh, uh, abelian extensions are actually repeated radical extensions. So motivated by this, we study uh, general square free radical towers. So by this, I mean the elements satisfy some kind of generality, which is uh, uh, which is not assuming much. And they are square free uh, simply because we can always embed it in a such a square free tower while preserving finiteness. And <clears throat> uh, so that is what we're going to look at. So if one were to do this same radical uh, towers thing in the non-modular case, it's not 
that interesting in that case it's uh, in an arbitrary radical tower it's quite easily seen that it's Cohen Macaulay so um, in that case it's not much okay so for the remainder of the talk I'll just um, call S to be an unramified regular local ring abbreviated by URLR of mixed characteristic P and L is going to be its fraction field K is a finite field extension and R is going to be the integral closure in that extension Okay, so um, the first thing that enthused um, us was that in 99, CADS showed that when K is the extension by a pth root of a square free element of S, R is Cohen Macaulay. So it looked encouraging in the sense that maybe when it's square free, that is a good behavior. But <clears throat> uh, actually, it need not be Cohen Macaulay when R is a finite general square free tower, unfortunately. In fact, it fails in the very first step uh, when you are joined pth roots of just two square free elements, for example. Okay, <clears throat> so um, one reduction we want to make, so for that I'll just assume SP is uh, a subring of S obtained by lifting the image of the Frobenius map on the factor ring back to S. So I'll call that subring SP. Then uh, we can do the following reduction. So firstly, if S is a I'm additionally assuming that S is a complete unramified regular local ring of mixed characteristic P and it has a perfect residue field, but uh, this, these are quite natural hypotheses. Then there exists a finite extension of unramified regular local rings such that the smaller one sits inside TP. So what is the point of this? Uh, the <clears throat> reason we want to do this is suppose the fraction field of this T is K prime and uh, script k is the join of k and k prime and let script r be the integral closure of s in script k then um, so this is our original field extension and this is our new um, field extension so if we have a join here uh, essentially what we can do is we can start over with this new um, unramified regular local ring it needs an argument so but the upshot is that we can assume that the elements whose roots we are joined have pth roots mod p. So uh, this allows many advantages. Uh, for example, it gives us a better control on the integral closure r. So this is one reduction we can make where we assume that all the elements whose roots we are joined have pth roots mod p. Okay, but this doesn't mean that when elements do not lie in sp, um, r is Cohen Macaulay. Here is an um, example, if you'd like, um, probably don't get into it in detail, but uh, if F is so and G is so, they're all uh, all satisfy our hypothesis, square free, co-prime, they're not in S2. And R is Cohen Macaulay, if and only if this ring is Cohen Macaulay, which needs a proof. But uh, seeing that this ring is not Cohen Macaulay is not too bad. And so, <clears throat> It doesn't mean that if we do, if, if we allow the elements to be outside, it is uh, nice behavior. But in fact, the integral closure of R adjoin the square root of X is actually Cohen Macaulay. So it's a small Cohen Macaulay algebra for R. So um, this ring also admits a small uh, Cohen Macaulay module. By an algebra, I I simply mean a Noetherian ring T. I mean a small Cohen Macaulay algebra. I mean uh, T admits a small Cohen Macaulay algebra T prime if there is an injective module finite map of rings such that T prime is Cohen Macaulay. So, in some sense, it's a module within a uh, small Cohen Macaulay module within algebra structure. So, I'd like to note here that uh, small Cohen Macaulay algebras do not exist for normal rings that contain the rational numbers because due to a simple trace obstruction. So, <clears throat> Um, they can so unless the ring itself is Cohen Macaulay, of course. And um, Bart showed in 2012 that examples of non-existence of small CM algebra. He gave examples of non-existence of small CM algebras in positive characteristic, but in mixed characteristic, um, examples of non-existence is is quite easy. One can just invert P. Uh, and once you invert P, we are essentially in the same situation as this. So 
uh, but we'll see many examples of existence of small CM algebras in mixed characteristic in our work and they do not seem to have been known earlier. Okay. Okay. So here, um, as we saw, the square feet towers complexity, so as to speak, increases quite fast. So to gain a handle on this, we make a careful study of the first case. Uh, which is a biradical extensions of S obtained by adjoining pth roots of sufficiently general square free elements, which I call F and G. Okay, so this is es essentially taking a dive into um, a situation to understand what is going on. And uh, we may think of it as the case where the Galois group is uh, ZP cross ZP uh, generically. So to just give a report on these results, I'll just maintain the following notation. Uh, let F and G be square free, uh, maximal ideal, relatively prime, or F and G are both units that are not pth powers in S. So capital F and capital G are going to denote these polynomials. They are monic, um, irreducible. And K, capital K is going to be the field extension obtained by joining the pth roots of these elements. So uh, here, capital R is the integral closure of this complete intersection. So um, it's more these two polynomials, F and G, which I shall call A. Okay. And uh, this symbol here, S P to the K wedge P to the N is going to denote the multiplicative subset of S of elements expressible as so for some X, Y in S. So the first observation is that uh, this ring A is regular in co-dimension one outside of uh, the primes that contain P. So, <clears throat> and it gets even better because there exists a unique height one prime that contains P as well. So there is exactly one singularity in uh, co-dimension one. So to knock off the easy cases, oops. So knock off the easy cases, we can see that R is cohen macaulay if um, one of these elements do not lie in SP and the other lies in um, S omega P. And uh, also if one of them is divisible by P, then R is cohen macaulay But as we saw earlier, if F and G do not lie in SP, then R need not be cohen macaulay So we need to make a reduction or else it gets uh, pretty messy. So, and the reduction is that we're going to assume from what we saw earlier that these elements lie in SP unless specified otherwise. Okay, <clears throat> so, so the first curious phenomenon which I want to point out is that R is actually cohen macaulay if at least one of these hypersurfaces is not normal. So it appears that this should be the more complicated case but um, not really. And surprisingly, so the non cohen macaulay cases occur when both of these are normal rings. Okay. So roughly speaking, the reason for this is due to an existence of an uh, unramified branch uh, over uh, S localized at P. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we already knocked out the case when one of them is not normal. So um, in the case that both of them are normal and there is this weird looking sufficient condition for R to be cohen macaulay So it's a uh, an membership criterion. And um, what, even though it looks weird at first, what it means, this thing means is that this subring is integrally closed. So it requires a few subrings to be integrally closed. And then it says R is cohen macaulay So for example, if P is two, it's simply saying S adjoin omega mu is normal. If P is three, it requires this ring and this ring to be normal. So um, the crucial aspect of this proposition three is that the conductor in this case is the P minus first symbolic power of P. And it has a very easy description. So we just throw in small p and we get <clears throat> the symbolic power. And this is a cohen macaulay ideal. And uh, so this fact plays a crucial role in the proof of the existence of MCMs in the non-CM cases. 
<clears throat> okay, so here is the summary of the biradical case. Uh, so uh, in this page, so S is an our standard setup, and we're assuming here P is at least three, just odd, and <clears throat> just for convenience right now. And uh, so in that case, as we saw, R is Cohen Macaulay. If these are the two sufficient conditions which we saw. And now suppose both of them are normal and we allow such a relation, that is FG lies in this multiplicative subset, then R is Cohen Macaulay if and only if this ideal here is a two generated ideal or all of S. So in particular, it shows that R need not be Cohen Macaulay because um, we can generate a plenty of examples where this is not a, uh, so. And <clears throat> Moreover, the projective dimension is small, and the number of generators is at most one more than the rank, which is p squared. So um, it looks like it's not too far from being Cohen Macaulay, at least on the surface. And if Q has grade three, then R admits a birational MCM. So we show that when this has grade three, it's not Cohen Macaulay. So it admits a birational MCM. So uh, here, uh, I just want to point out one thing. So this assumption here, that FG lies here, and this uh, assumption of this being grade three, they're not really assuming too much. They are like generality conditions. We can kind of always reduce to these hypotheses. So, um, <clears throat> so in particular, as a corollary, uh, we don't, if you don't want to assume that those elements are in SP, then uh, if we start with, as long as we allow complete with perfect residue field, then we can pick any two elements that form a regular sequence with P, then the integral closure of R in such a um, extension admits an MCM. Okay, uh, just for the sake of completion, I didn't address the mixed characteristic two case. And in that case, the extensions are automatically abelian. So we have some sharper results and moreover, the splitting patterns of primes that lie over two are quite different. And um, when P is at least three, the pth roots of unity in S actually um, ramify P. So um, we don't quite have the same legroom in that case. So I won't uh, really go through this again. It's pretty similar, uh, the mixed characteristic just, but there, is, uh, there are subtle differences. Uh, but the point is that R is Cohen Macaulay. We can characterize when R is Cohen Macaulay exactly. So it's an if and only if. And um, moreover, we need lesser generality conditions. So if R is not Cohen Macaulay, R admits a birational MCM. Okay. So again, the corollary uh, when the complete and the perfect residue field case we can just pick any two square free elements that are relatively prime and we know that the integral closure here is at which MCM. Okay. <clears throat> so instead, let me just point out the highlights of what this means as to our goal. So the obstruction to R being Cohen macaulay is the second CCG module. So where I is this ideal P H1 H2 where H1 and H2 denote lifts of pth roots of F and G mod P. Uh, um, we have assumed that because we have reduced to that case. So uh, by obstruction, I mean that this is a sum end of R as an S module. And it appears that R is not too far from being Cohen macaulay in the sense of uh, what we saw, low projective dimension and low number of generators, but uh, it's a little deceptive because if dimension is at least three, then it could be that does not even satisfy S3. Um, but another uh, side effect of this is that it's easy to generate non Cohen Macaulay R and also failures of uh, Roberts's theorem. So um, um, we can, uh, it's, there are plenty. So, okay. So what is the MCM that we construct? So precisely speaking, it is this module. Uh, it is HOM A uh, of this um, ideal product JP. And J is the conductor of R to that 
complete intersection A and P is the unique Hydron prime that contains P. So it is possible to explicitly describe R and all the MCMs in question just like so in the sense we can provide generators for them over the base regular local ring. <clears throat> so moreover, these the small projective dimension and the small number of generators can be used to construct non-trivial Linco and Macaulay sequences in the sense of Bud, Hoxter, and Ma for these things. Uh, by non-trivial, what I mean is that we already have the stronger conclusion that it admits an MCM. But if we don't want to use that and just construct a, a non-trivial sequence, that would also be possible. Okay. So the techniques involve uh, the following three things. We study closely the structure of the conductor uh, of R to this complete intersection. And uh, that is where <coughs> uh, most of these results come from. And um, A is Gorenstein and J is unmixed. So R is cohen macaulay if and only if this factoring is cohen macaulay So we can use this to tell when R is cohen macaulay And to show R admits a birational MCM, we choose a suitable ideal I, such that I star is a J star module, and it has the correct depth. So uh, I'll, yeah, what does it mean for the general case? So uh, this is general abelian cases, ongoing work with Dan Katz. And uh, within that, the first case is when the P torsion of the Galois group is annihilated by P. So in other words, the P torsion is just um, uh, a direct sum of copies of Z mod P. So in this case, um, uh, we have some results, but I won't get into the details. Rather, I'll just point out like a workflow. So the strategy is to first reduce to the P torsion uh, of the part of the Galois group. And then by Kumar theory, we look at general square free SP towers. So assuming all these um, reductions and we work with the intuition we derive from the pi radical case. So one of the key uh, uh, behaviors here is when the roots lie in S P wedge P squared. So by this, what I mean is that if we are in our standard setup, and if we pick finitely many elements from this multiplicative subset that are square free and mutually co-prime, and if we are joined roots of these elements, such that P divides Ni and P squared does not for all I, then the integral closure of S in this extension is cohen macaulay So uh, this result enables us uh, to find the existence of small CM algebras for a broad class of non cohen macaulay rings. And essentially, the rest of the um, strategy um, hinges on bridging the gap between SP and SPHP squared, so as to speak, because we've already reduced SP and there's good behavior here. So, yeah, I think um, I should stop here. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, we are open for questions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, Manoj. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you go to that slide which said it doesn't even satisfy S3? I yes. Just couldn't understand what you said. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, here. Uh, ah, this, yeah, yes. Ah, what? Uh, uh, that cis2 is a direct amount of R, right? Yes. That, that's what you said? Yes, yes. But then why? Uh, so that, that exactly. Uh, but if the dimension of S is 3 and the projective dimension is less than or equal to 1, would it get, uh, oh, you mean it fails exactly when dimension S is equal to 3? Uh, when it's 3, um, it, it's certainly not surprising because uh, if it's not cohen macaulay then it, it can't satisfy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, in higher Even, dimensions, uh, uh, if the projective dimension is 1, wouldn't it satisfy, uh, uh, wouldn't it satisfy S3? Um, uh, not necessarily, okay. no. No, uh, so that's what is surprising in the sense that I mean it, it need not because um, <clears throat> um, 
it has to be high enough CCG for it to be uh, satisfied. That is true. I mean, or, or, yeah, that is that is true. Yeah. So uh, I guess, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Prashant, what do we know about the integral closure when the Galva group is a simple group um, of the extension? Yeah. So, um, in that Base case, is regular, base ring is regular local. Yes. Um, so, in that case, it um, pretty much we can say that it admits MCM. Yes. So, there, there are one or two exceptions which need to be handled, but uh, in that case, uh, uh, I should like. Say almost always it admits uh, MCM. So, oh. but like at present, trying to look at when uh, when it's a product of uh, simple groups. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what what is the reference for that? Um, so uh, so so for these things, um, that is, let me just write it here. So um, there is this paper by. Um, so CADS 99 um, proceedings of AMS, it's called <clears throat> On the Existence of um, Birational, uh, uh, I think it's On the Existence of MCM modules or PA root extensions. Root extensions, and um, <clears throat> so that pretty much um, he tries to address the simple um, group case. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't see further questions. So thank thank you very much, Prashant, for your interesting talk. Thank you for the opportunity for your attention. Welcome. We'll close the meeting for today and meet next Friday.